Hello and welcome to Punchbag. The Department of Transport, that haven of goodwill, collaboration and team effort, is considering a plan to tax motorists according to the distance they drive and then send them a monthly bill. Anything up to 45 pence a mile, but don't worry, it won't happen for years, if it happens at all, because no government, especially this one, has the bottle to do anything that radical, have they? My guests tonight as we discuss transport are Andrew Davis, the boss of Britain's biggest green motoring organisation. Yes, that's right. He used to advise the Greater London Council on transport and planning issues before helping to set up the Environmental Transport Association, Britain's first motoring group for drivers concerned about minimising the environmental damage caused by the car. He supports congestion charging. Hugh Bladen doesn't. He's a self-confessed car lover. Based in Western Supermare, he's a spokesman for the Association of British Drivers. He feels motorists are a soft target for governments looking to raise taxes. taxes. Palmjit Danda has been described as everything you would expect of New Labour, but he's young, so there is hope for the future. I don't mean it, Palmjit. He was a Labour activist, still is, I suppose, and assistant national organiser of the communications union Connect. Last June, he became the MP for Gloucester. Palmjit, before we go into transport, I just wanted to talk to you. There seem to have been murmurings on the back benches, worries about what the government is planning to do with the Americans in Iraq. There was a cabinet briefing on that, on that today. If British forces go into action against Iraq over the coming weeks or months, is Tony Blair going to be able to carry people like you on the back benches with him? Well, we're all uh, rather battle-weary after Afghanistan, but uh, let's never forget Afghanistan happened because of September the 11th, and I think September the 11th actually left its mark on all of us, including us on the back benches. And if there is a real danger of uh, weapons of mass destruction being produced in Iraq and used, then uh, I, I think the vast majority, majority of us will actually accept that, reluctantly, there's something that we may have to do about the it. The trouble is the UN haven't found any evidence of that whatsoever so far. Well, if Saddam Hussein decides to play ball and allow the independent uh, inspectors onto his turf and we can really get a good idea of exactly what is going on, then that will be a step in the right direction. But isn't it the job of the UN to sanction anything like that? And at the moment it just seems to be President Bush going after Iraq with Tony Blair riding on his coattails. Well, we've got to remember as well, though, this is no ordinary dictator that we're talking about here. In Saddam Hussein, we've got somebody who's used chemical weapons in the past and used them on his own people. So it's not a normal set of circumstances. I don't think we're about to get pressed into any kind of conflict in the short term, but I think it's a situation that we're all going to have to watch very, very carefully. OK, thank you for that. Well, we're here mainly to talk about transport. So, Bob Constantine has been looking at that great road toll debate. When it comes to the big issues, Tony Blair wants to encourage blue sky thinking, and in the case of road congestion, he's got it. An influential think tank believes the answer lies up in space a satellite to monitor car movements so that we can pay as we drive. Ken Livingston also wants to price the motorist out of central London. Pie in the sky or the next stealth tax coming out of a bank account near you. <laughs> It's a daily reality for millions of motorists. Roads are getting busier, journey times longer, tempers shorter. We joined the Williams family, daughter Samantha, mum Karen and dad John, as they headed from home in Bradley Stoke to school and work in Bristol. Certain points on the journey there are traffic jams whatever time of day you go, so it's inevitable that's going to happen. Uh, the time that it takes now to get to work as compared to when we first moved here back in 87 is probably more than doubled. It's not hard to see why. The boom in office and house building on the northern fringe has not been matched by public transport. You can look at the cars around you and uh, most of them have single drivers in them. Uh, which, you know, I think there is a, a case for encouraging those single drivers to uh, to change their habits and, and go onto the bus. If only it were that easy. John claims his three-point journey can't be done by bus, and the family's about to acquire another driver. 
Sam, have you, uh, have you heard about your driving test yet? Yeah, I've booked it, not telling you. But it's always like this when I'm learning to drive, when I'm coming back from my lessons. Samantha leaves for school, but the M32 is still to come. A government think tank actually wants to charge motorists for using busy routes like this. There's no incentive for motorists to change the time of their journey, no incentives in terms of saving cost. 85% of our congestion in Britain occurs in urban areas. Uh, we know, for example, that Bristol has the worst congestion in the UK after, after London. And most of that congestion is occurring at the very, very busy times. This morning is probably one of the, an average journeys, and it's taken us almost an hour to get to this point. Um, so things aren't getting any better. Bristol has already experimented with road tolls, using overhead sensors to charge dummy smart cards. The idea was to see if motorists would change their habits, and John Williams was among the volunteers. My wife and my daughter uh, share the journeys with me, so to some extent I'm, I'm car sharing already, and that was part of the, the project was to encourage people to car share. Uh, so the actual cost to me uh, wasn't huge in that sense. But if I was a lone driver, then I think it would have put me off actually coming in on, on the route that I come in now because of the, the economies of scale. Oh, so it would, have, it would have in fact worked? It would have forced you, priced you off the road? It would have made me look at the way I go into work now. Um, you know, the rat runs, etc., that I would tend to use rather than the main roads. In London, Mayor Ken Livingstone wants to charge motorists £5 to enter parts of the centre, using security cameras to catch non-payers. Under the Commission for Integrated Transport proposals, motorists would pay up to 45p a mile at peak times, but fuel duty and car tax would be cut. At least one in five of road users who are travelling during the rush hour don't have to be travelling then. I mean, I'll give you an example. There's an awful lot of lorries on the road then which could deliver at different times. There's a number of leisure journeys that are made during the rush hour. If there was a price incentive, they would do it out with the peak hour. So how would it work? This Swindon firm thinks it has one of the answers. It has already developed a tracking device for security vans, ambulances and the like. A national network of masts like this could, it believes, be linked to satellites to record vehicle movements all over the country. What this does, is, is, is it enables vehicles to be tracked very well in cities and built up areas where we tend to get the congestion. So it's the combination of technology and it's using um, data from vehicles to be able to predict and then manage the congestion. The best way to evade a road toll would be not to use a car at all. And Carpenter from Clevedon forsakes hers whenever possible, walking to pick up her children from school and wanting others to follow her example. I don't think that it's really going to come from tolls and tariffs. I think the real solution to congestion is going to come from within. People are going to have to really want to reduce the congestion themselves rather than being forced to do it from outside. The car has ironically encouraged us to live further away from where we need to be. But technology to price us or prize us out may be just around the corner. Come on, Hugh, we can't, we can't go on like that. We've got to do something, even if that means you, even you have got to get out of your car and get on the bus. Uh, you won't get me out of my car and onto a bus. Why not? Let, let me, well, let me first of all, it's obvious what I'm going to say straight away. The motorist is paying £38 billion worth of taxes. One seventh of the government's revenue comes from the motorist. One quarter of that, or less than a quarter, is put back into all forms of transport that includes rail. So I think the motorist is paying his way already. I think what we need to do is examine why congestion is getting worse. And okay. there are several reasons. First of all, we've got an increased uh, economic activity, which is no bad thing. Secondly, people have become wealthier. And I'm sure nobody would say that's a bad thing either. Uh, and thirdly, we do have something which was referred to in your, your opening piece, uh, the school run. The school run actually probably accounts for between 12 and 15 percent of congestion during the, the term time. I think most people would say that when the school holidays are on, it is markedly different. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I mean, th I, I fully understand in, in the uh, context of um, safety and, and the way things are at the moment, 
why parents want to take their children to school in the car, that's perfectly understandable, but it does create a problem. But there, there, there are bigger issues. It's estimated 24,000 people a year die prematurely because of air pollution. Doesn't that figure into it? It doesn't figure into it whatsoever. Uh, the, the air is getting cleaner all the time. It's scheduled to get cleaner by 2005 anyway without anything else happening at all. Cars now well, well, are no, no, just finished. Cars now are 98 percent cleaner than they were 10 years ago. Andrew Davis, how are you going to convince Hugh to abandon well, his car? I won't, for a start. Uh, there'd be no, and there's no need to. There's so few people who follow his thoughts that um, it doesn't really matter. But we're always going to have people who didn't like women getting the vote. You know, didn't like. Uh, uh, a liberal society and they'll, they'll always be there and we need to them to cut our teeth on their debates and understand what they're saying. The, um, since uh, the ETA's been around 10 years we've had 20,000 miles more new road um, and what we've we done we've filled them promptly more activity they're free it's the only one of the only things in life broadly speaking the only thing in life that's free you go to a football match, the best seats you pay more for. You go to theatre, the best seats you pay. You use your phone at peak times, you pay more for. Everything else that we experience. You want to live in the best place in town, you pay more for it. Everything you pay more for. If you want to go down the most popular road, which is the busiest road, at the busiest time, why not introduce something that charges you for the cost, especially when 60% of people won't even pay it at and all. We, we see that the, the technology is there and available to Already, do that Already, in now. fact, uh, nearly half the cars, well, nearly all the cars being made now have the technology so on them. What are, what are we talking about, say, to come into Bristol, the biggest city in our region? It's, it, it depends on the people themselves as to how, how they move and what decisions they make over time. In other words, you start the, the fee very cheap, say, one pence, tuppence a mile. If there is no change in movement, eventually you have to increase it to three or four pence a mile until, is, they, until they make the change. A, there isn't a politician in this country that would dare to suggest coming up with that. They're too scared to do it, aren't they? I think the problem is politicians, bless their cotton socks, are always going to try and be like the oil in an engine. They're, they're there to make the engine go. They're not the power thrust of an economy or a society. They can't go too far ahead of the population, nor must they go too far behind them. So they're, they're going to follow what they think the public are going to require. Now, the problem is congestion charging, as sold by large organizations as well as um, uh, Hughes' organization, um, is believed to be another tax. If, as this proposal is, a revenue neutral tax completely. In other words, for every pound people pay by a congestion tax, there'll be a pound taken off. I'm saying if, uh, it's a big mm. if. But if it is done that way, therefore the only people who are paying more on average are going to be the people who are all the time going through congested areas. Well, Whereas that, most yeah. people, as a, as a report and the model suggests, 60% uh, of the population will not pay the tax at all. So they will see their, their fuel prices come down or their VAD go to zero. And remember, we talked about £6 billion pounds being raised this way. If it was added onto your £32 billion, it'll be a lot more. Let me, well, let me bring the politician yeah. in here. Palm, I mean, transport is one of the issues mm. which, like it or not, when the Department of Transport is not slugging each other off or emailing each other, this is something you've got to sort out, and it's getting worse by the day, and it's one of those issues that the public readily identifies with. They live with it day in and day out, and they're saying to Stephen Byers, sort it out, mate, but he hasn't got a clue, has he? Well, it's interesting what Andrew said in terms of the financial implications of this. You look at the city that we're sitting in at the moment, uh, about a million pounds is lost a day through congestion, through people just sitting where they are. We've seen the average speed in Bristol come down from 16 miles an hour to 11 miles per hour over a relatively short period of time. But a Labour-controlled a Labour mm -hmm. authority here with yeah. a Labour-controlled government still hasn't got the bottle because they're fearful of the public reaction to well, say, we've tried it, there's been an experiment. People, they, pe people vote for politicians on policies that they want, quite frankly. And there's no politician in the land that can impose something that people don't want on people. Now, we all want to see less congestion on our roads. We all want to see better public services. We all want to see better public transport. But sooner or later, we've actually got to also say, yes, we're prepared to pay for this. I've actually, I actually quite like some of the schemes that we've seen here in Bristol, a couple of good examples. Uh, the, the government's given £11 million for um, uh, car sharing schemes to get more passengers into one car. And also Dro money. Drops in yeah, the ocean. Well, we're talking drops about, in you know, ocean. in one given year to reduce emissions as well. And we're looking at £180 billion over, over 10 years. Now, that's 
that's you know not just tackling one area that's in terms of investment in rail local solutions and also roads as well but as Andrew says I do agree with him the more roads you create it doesn't mean that you're actually going to do away with the problem because you've got cities like Paris which have fantastic public transport but at the same time it's probably the most congested city in Europe. Hugh I've, yeah. I've queued going into Western Supermare and I've queued coming out of it and if you come into Bristol you know what a nightmare it is traveling around it. Now, what, what, what would you do? Well I, I, we were talking about the causes of uh, congestion and uh, I, I didn't go on to say that one of the problems is that the motor car has not been properly allowed for. Now, I've got nothing against public transport oh, at all. No, you go to, you no, go to California where they I, built the whole I'll state, the whole you, state of I'll California just tell you why is I built say that. on on predicated the, the, on the motor car. It is utter, utter nonsense to think that any country is going to follow California down a road, which means parts of San Jose, which were only built in the 70s, there wasn't anything but orange groves before the 70s. They've got motorways, which are eight-lane motorways, which are three miles apart parallel, right? They built a, a freeway, then they built another one, then they built another one. Within four years, packed. The, the Americans miss, understand... Completely missed the point. Let, Can let, I just let, come let in? Because I haven't finished. You cannot build um, a town that will cater you, for all the cars... Perhaps that if will, I could just finish what I was going to say. I'll let you finish. But One of the problems we have is that you see on the, on the piece that people are queuing up to get into town. Now, if there was more car parking, then people wouldn't be driving around looking for somewhere Where to leave you? their car. They could get in dump the Where car you and get on with the car park in well, Bristol? Well, there are plenty of empty spaces no, 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 around in Bristol that could be used person quite talking easily. An amateur person talking We've and got examples right around absurd. the world where they built whole city centres, five layers thick with car parks. It's not the car parks. It's a nice idea, but frankly, it any is a nice idea. Tell you it's a very good idea. It's, it's a nice one idea. Of the it's a problem. sort of person in the, the pub more, idea. It's a sort the of more pre you make it difficult. Idea. It for really people is not working. To park and I think it's so sad that people give you the time of day to talk about it. Heidelberg has Let four me. layers of car park in its city centre right across the whole car park. It's not that. The problem is you can't get a car. I run a breakdown organisation. I like cars. I'm not anti car. I'm just saying the pragmatic modeling shows that you cannot base a city on the car no the, the car only city in the world that's based on the car is Houston that's based on the car and they're finding the whole of their society is collapsing one, it's one very reason, tough. Let me, pardon, one reason people say they they use their cars is because we haven't got decent public transport open any local paper you see people moaning about the buses we've got virtual private monopolies in your neck of the woods with stagecoach in much of the rest of the region with first group the government's done nothing about that these companies can charge what they want run services cancel them when they want you've done nothing about it so Richard I was just sitting back and enjoying that for a moment <laughs> but, you, but you see just how impassioned this argument yeah, is right. but in terms of the buses buses rail road it's all part of the solution it's got to work together but part of the difficulties we've got you mentioned the buses um, there's actually been a 24% decrease since deregulation and the Tories did actually sell off an awful lot of bus services but, but we've seen since 1999 your government's done absolutely nothing well, about that's that where you were going to let me answer your question now Richard since 1999 we've actually seen more bus journeys and good news Virtually stories London, good, 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 well, good news stories well you deregulated. talk about London you talk about London what, what about Gloucester but in terms of rail you know, one of the things that you won't be covering is the fact that we're about to see a doubling of the service the rail service from from Birmingham to Gloucester and from London to Gloucester and we'll now have hourly trains and that's got to be part of the solution I'd but, agree, but I'd it's agree an interesting with you argument this, but the, the, the thing is the, mm -hmm. Hugh is right in the sense that we are car based society 85% yeah. of our journeys are by car and therefore that's why we come out with this, we've got to rationalise how we use the car. Because if you double the number of people travelling by rail between two cities, you find that only four people went last week and it's doubled up to eight. That outside of London, hardly anyone in significant terms travels by, by rail. It is not going to be part of the solution, much though that we would like I, it to I be. Just can't, I yeah. cannot accept that. That's ridiculous. What? I mean, I travelled up to London on Tuesday. I went to the House of Commons on Tuesday for a meeting and the, the train was full. It was absolutely full to, to capacity. And it was, you know, one of these one, two, five things. You couldn't get anybody else country. on it. Sixty percent of all the journeys in this country start or end in London, which is what I said. Mm. So they're virtually involving London. If you doubling of any other routes, the cross rail, they do not answer the eighty five percent people travelling by car. Well, they they will go at the margin. You, you, just, you, don't, you don't get people doubling a service if they don't think they're going to make any money out of it, quite frankly. I'm not so knocking it, but I'm not saying I'm, it's not I'm, the answer. A train it, it is, cannot it is a, 
a train cannot do the journey that you want to do by car. That's right. For a start, you've got to go down to the station, and then you've got to get your train, and it may not go where you want to go. It's going to cost you far more than it would go, go by car anyway, even if there's just one of you. I mean, it cost me £56 to go to London and back. That's well, I could do that easily on half a tank of petrol or diesel. That's the argument you've got to win over somehow, Andrew. Just well, right now, people say that's a hell of a lot of money to get on a train and go cheaper by car. Very Absolutely. Uh, our, our view as an organisation, you choose the route that serves you best as a rational decision maker. What we want is congestion charging coming in to make you make the right rational decision, the decision that's important for you, that is also, uh, by so doing, also the best decision for society. At the moment, people are making rational decisions which are in conflict of what we all need as a society. Can in I other just words, gen gen we've got to end. Get, Sorry, we've, we've, time has flown by. We've had a fantastic and heated discussion. Yeah. We have to end it there. I'm sure you might want to comment on something you've heard from tonight. Email us, write to us, whatever. Bob's got all the details. Yes, we haven't moved. We couldn't afford the petrol, I don't suppose. We're still at the same address. Punch bag at ITV.